Stay hungry, stay foolish. We create human-centered interactions and experiences in our field. Empathetic purpose drives our every decision. Mobile first, in reality, it's humans first. This same mentality turned inward forms the cornerstone of something amazing, a creative culture. Designers and front-enders have a unique advantage in solving the cultural problems in business that are sucking the life out of us. The principles discussed in this book derive from the perspectives and skill sets we already use daily. Empathy, objectivity, and yes, ample creativity. We welcome author of Cultivating a Creative Culture, Justin Dower. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Aiden. It's good to be here. You start the book, Justin, the way many people unfortunately start their week with the Sunday night dreadies. You sit down on Sunday night, but you just can't shake the feeling of dread for the week ahead. Yeah, and it's unfortunately a universal tale, if you will. I know it's not anything tied to a specific industry or tied to a specific geographic location. I write that from personal experience. I write that from the heart. I wrote an article that kind of preceded the book, and then I, I wrote the book, Cultivating Creative Culture, following that. And the feedback about this feeling, you said the Sunday dreadies, I think that's very applicable, was cross-media, cross-industry. I, I received feedback from people in, in newspaper and people in, in TV and in radio and obviously design and agencies where you have that feeling going into a new week, which should be the most exciting feeling that you are about to innovate, you are about to create, you're about to do something exciting, some good for people, but rather you're thinking about the previous week and you're thinking about who threw me under the bus in a meeting I had, who was pointing at their watch when I had to leave a little bit, a little bit early one day to, to get my kid. I don't want to go back and deal with that dynamic again. Finding the right cultural fit, the right place to do good work is such a non-trivial thing cross industry. So the book that I had written, and I'm currently working on the second edition as well, is really written to talk about how to, I say human-centered design and I say human-centered culture, how to operate on both sides of that, how to do good for people in our creative process and how to do good for people in your interactions at the office. I mean, we can't preach outwardly about empathy and doing good for people if we're not treating ourselves good as well. Yeah, and this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, people who are creative get a job in a creative agency. They're coding, they're designing, they're developing, and they're doing things that they loved and probably would do for free in their spare time. But it's the environment. It's these t fantastically talented, creative people and they get into these unhealthy cultures and it feels like there's nowhere else to go. And you say in the book, it's tantamount to psychological abuse. Absolutely. These people that we're talking about that are, like you said, you, they would kind of, they would do it for free because this is what their passion is. A large part of their identity comes from their work. And these are tinkerers, people who are certainly coming in and doing work, but people who go home at night and they, and they're sitting on the couch and they're reading articles. They see something cool online or something they've read and they're tearing it apart and they're figuring out how does this work? What are the accessibility constraints here? How, what, how, what was their design process probably like? And you have these people who have this fire within them and then they come into the office and the office marginalizes them and you're less an individual and you're more a name on a spreadsheet. And that just absolutely sucks the passion and sucks the life out of you, sucks the creativity, the innovation out of people. That's the most tragic thing when you, when you have brilliance and fire, and then it's terminated at the expense of the bottom line. Yeah, and you mentioned they're reading an article. So somebody's reading an article at home, and the terrible thing is somebody could easily be reading that article in work because it is actually part of their work, but they're fearful to do so. As you say in the book, people are often screening their screens so people don't see what they're reading because maybe it's not billable work. Yeah, I've, in hindsight, it's, it's air quotes comical, but I've worked in places before where everyone kind of had the same posture about them where you're kind of leaning forward. I don't know what kind of angle it is, 45 degree angle over, over your desk because you're trying to shield your screen because, you know, God forbid you have 10 minutes free and you want to see what's trending on a specific hashtag on Twitter or you want to look at Facebook for a second or read an article and people are have this fear about them, a fear grounded in reality that if their supervisor walks by, 
And they're going to say, you know, don't have enough work to do. Like, what, what are you doing? I've experienced that. And I, you know, I, I've worked at places where everyone kind of adopted that same posture you're waiting for to screen your, cover your screen. And there's just no reason for that. When you remove the individual from the equation, like ev- everything is lost. Like I, you know, I keep saying innovation, having energy to, to create that passion, that drive, that's all just lost when people feel like they can't let their guard down for 10 minutes. I mean, that it's, it's absolutely preposterous. And neuroscience studies, research, et cetera, all say that you need to turn off in order to turn on. So you need that space, that white space yourself of thought staring out the window, because that's when the ideas come, not when you're constantly turned on. This is what I find really, really unfortunate in so many agencies. Also, the lack of psychological safety. If you don't have psychological safety, it's the equivalent to being always in fight or flight mode. Yeah, you know, you, anytime you have your guard up all the time, it's exhausting. Like think about, you know, when you've worked all day and you come home and then your family comes over after work or you have friends over and it, it's it's great, but you you know, you work 9 to 5 and then you're on from like 5 to 9 at night and it's great to be with people, but you can't relax, you can't pause. And then when they you had a good time, but when the people leave, you're kind of exhausted. It's hard to be on all the time. And that's why I uh, write about this notion called pausing with intent. And, you know, we talk about just pausing to, you know, space out or look out the window. Obviously, that's valuable. Everyone needs time to defuse. But I'm also a strong proponent of that pause with intent motion. That's to say, if there's a coffee machine in the office, let people stop for a little bit and chat with their coworkers without fear of retribution for Somebody, like I said, looking at the watch and being like, don't you have to get back to your desk? That moment of bonding, that moment of human connection, that moment is absolutely vital. And not just to humanize one another at the office, but I mean, a lot comes out of those pause dialogue where you can let your guard down. And maybe you're going to talk about an issue on a project. An idea might spark from that. Or you're going to talk about a piece of music you heard or a movie you saw over the weekend. And those dialogues like are vital to just have a human connection and have that dynamic at the office. But so much good, so many sparks happen when you don't have that feeling of someone looking over your back and kind of tapping on their watch. And we're going to get into solutions now in a second, but there's a saying I love and I mentioned to you, to you before we came on air, which is the writing on the wall needs to match the cultures down the hall. So you can talk whatever you want about your culture. It can be on your website, your mission statement, et cetera. But it's ultimately the behaviors within the company that are what the company is. It's the culture of the company. And you say there's a way that we can shift this in companies. And you talk about using the design skills of an agency to design day zero, for example, for an employee. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned you know, the signage on the wall the good news is now, I mean, the way people hunt for jobs or the way people look for new careers or the next evolution of their role, people go on sites like Glassdoor and Indeed and these other job sites, and they post reviews of companies. And if the signage on the wall doesn't match the culture, people are very transparent and candid about that. So I don't think that is as hidden anymore, I guess, within cultures. If it doesn't match, it kind of bubbles to the surface. And that's where there's damage internally to the business, there's da- damage to morale, and there's damage to the brand. I think culture and brand are absolutely synonymous. You know, to your original question about redesigning the first day, think about you know the average employee coming into the office. It's usually on a Monday. It's on a Monday because there's five we- five days spanning ahead of you. And the natural air quotes momentum for a business is you come in. Maybe there's some onboarding where you're you know you're in training or. Uh, you, hopefully your, your computer is waiting for you at the desk and it's not uncommon at all. This has happened to me in my career. This is not, you know, a rare story in any sense for you to get right into a project. You know, maybe there's some, uh, you know, light training in the morning where you, you get training on how to log into the network and set up your email. I've had it before I come in and I'm within a project and, you know, the first, uh, hour and a half or first hour. And that was in a, a very senior role at a company that probably should have known better. It's not a surprising thing for that process to be very sterile and dehumanized. And what I like to do, I call it the new day one. And rather than uh, starting on a Monday, uh, have people start on a Friday because I'm looking for a different momentum rather than those five days for you know project work. And when somebody comes in on a Friday, the next day that follows that is obviously the weekend. 
And I welcome people in and I say the welcome as a key thing because again, I've walked into businesses before my first day and nobody knew who I was or what my position was or my supervisor hadn't told them they were interviewing. So welcoming somebody at the door, you know, showing them around with no rush in my stride at that point, consider yourself walking in that first day. I keep saying the human connection, we'll talk about empathy quite a bit. How does anyone feel walking into a new place with new faces and everyone else is kind of comfortable about their space and you feel a little small, you feel a little awkward and it's good to have someone there to welcome you and show you around and have your back. So, you know, I welcome someone in, their computer is is waiting at, at their desk. There's no scrambling, did anyone order their computer? Is their computer here? Everything's waiting. The computer's set up, it's turned on. You know, I usually ask in advance, is there anything that you need, you know, specifically uh, with a mouse or a keyboard? I'll have the team sign a note. You know, everyone says, welcome aboard, or there's flowers there, or, you know, I mean, just again, it's all about the human experience. You're signing up for a business to contribute your abilities and, and there's a, a, a mutual trust there. That doesn't mean it doesn't, it has to be an impersonal dehumanized experience. So welcome the person, we show them to their desk. There's some light banter, introduce them to their coworkers. The morning, I just like to call, there's a setup in the morning, a configuration and, and some dialogues about, like I said, setting up email and things like that. Come noon, the day at the office is effectively over at that point. So it's, it's not a, a, a rocket science thing to take someone out to lunch in the first day. Everything, you know, everyone kind of does that, I hope, at least. Uh, you, know, you go out to lunch with uh, your supervisor or your, your, your coworkers. When we go out to lunch, I break, that, I break that into two parts. So we go out to lunch and, and you know, people have food in their mouths in between bites. You don't want the dialogue at that point to be too serious. It's, it's more like, you know, how long have you lived here? You know, do you have any family around here? Uh, what do you like to do uh, you know, for hobbies, things like that? that's more the casual dialogue side of things over lunch. After that, I'm a huge proponent of coffee culture and interactions over coffee. I usually take someone to a coffee shop that has tea as well, just in case someone's not a coffee drinker. And then we, we get into it a little more. We, uh, you know, I, I come from the, uh, design world, uh, human centered design specifically these days. And we talk about our process. We talk about the way we work. I talk about, uh, current clients we're interacting with or, uh, how, how the team functions on the day to day. And when that concludes and, and granted the person at this point has gone through the interview process, we've looked at their portfolio and, and all those things, but I'm, I'm looking for more about what fuels a person in a cognitive design, visual communication, strategic sense than what a portfolio could ever yield. So I'll ask somebody, take me someplace in the city. And uh, we, we live in, uh, operate in the city, uh, downtown Chicago, take me someplace in the city that inspires you. When I ask people that I've gotten immediate answers, I've gotten, you know, kind of like deer in headlights looks because you're putting someone on the, on the spot there where they're a little stunned. But you know, the goal there is spatially, I want to understand what is it about a place that is made or contributed to, to the person the way they are. Um, and people have taken me to a music venue or we've gone to, uh, just a scenic place in the city, or we've gone to a place where somebody had a, a major life decision to make in, in a, in a career path evolution sense. So it's not always, you know, sunshine and rainbows. I mean, people change or make decisions, uh, or places are important to people for various reasons. And, you know, we go there, I don't certainly don't probe or poke, but as, as comfortable as someone is telling me about it, you know, we, we kind of talk through it. What about this place? Uh, has inspired you or impacted the way you are or why you do what you do. And there's no rush at that point even. We just kind of, uh, you know, linger a little bit. I, I talked about the the act of the linger, the act of pausing with intent. And we just kind of talk through it. And that often, you know, wraps up maybe three o'clock, four o'clock. And it's not like, okay, let's go back to the office and work. At that point, we're done because I mentioned that different momentum I'm seeking. I, I want someone to go back to their home or, you know, take a, a leisurely stroll someplace and, and think about what, what just happened about that human connection, about, you know, the culture being demonstrative in action rather than just, you know, like we said, something printed on the wall or on a t-shirt. And then they go through the weekend and they talk to their family and they talk to their friends. And th there's a whole new dynamic come Monday that, that has, has changed rather than, you know, people coming in and, and flat and, and, getting thrown into, you know, a project or, or sterile training. So that is the connection I'm looking for. And I think that kind of sets the tone for everything that's to come.
And I love the way you've used the skills of your the agency, your skills as a human-centered designer to create a persona. It's that persona. It's like first day in school, first day in work. It's all the same psychological impact that's having on somebody. You mention in the book this great thing, and I'm sure I'll butcher it because you have a lot of Swedish culture infused into your own thoughts and experiences over time. And you share in the book this idea of the Swedish jantelagen, where no one person is greater than the rest. Yeah, it's interesting. So when you ask a Swede about a Swede about it, that that context can go either way. It can have some severity to it in terms of like no one should be greater than anyone else. But when you apply it to a business setting or a creative culture, that base setting that everyone is equal, it's such amazing things happen. I mean, that term "everyone has a seat at the table" can get some eye rolls, but the core dynamic of that. That if I'm in a, in a meeting with C-level people or I'm in a meeting with uh, someone who's a little more uh, junior in their careers, no one should be afraid to speak up based on that level of seniority or where their, where their box falls on an org chart. I mean, that stuff is absolute BS. Everyone has unique insight that needs to be respected and valued. And respect and value and empathy absolutely baked into the work we do in a creative sense. But there's no reason that shouldn't be baked into our cultural interactions as well. I mean, think about when you run a workshop. I mean, if you're with a client and you're running a workshop, ideally, you want varied levels of seniority in there. You want people who are answering the phones at the front desk. You want C-level people. You want mid-level in their careers, management, what have you, because everyone is going to bring a different viewpoint to the table. You want those varied voices. You want those varied opinions. You want those varied insights. It's all about inclusion at that point. We should be striving for inclusion at the office, in our process, and in the work we produce. Those principles in design and human-centered design absolutely should apply to our cultural dynamics. And in the book, you have several companies that you admire, and many of our listeners will be familiar with the work of Ray Dalio and his excellent book, Principles, and in particular, his principle of radical transparency. But in the book, you share a different tale of transparency and action with the local Chicago, I believe, Nick's Pizzeria and Pub. Right. I mean, that's really an amazing story. Uh, Nick Cirillo um, owns a couple of pizzerias in the Chicagoland area. And, you know, that that's a portion of his identity. He's written books. He's an international speaker. He's been a TEDx speaker. He's been featured on radio and television, online, everywhere. And it all comes back to the way he runs his business. He, uh, he's, you know, transformed his pizzerias into multi-million dollar business has been published so much because of his cultural interactions with his team and the way they are empowered and the way everyone has a seat at the table. And I mean, I, you know, organizational flatness and transparency, again, that's going to get you eye rolls uh, by and large based on how it's employed or used. But this guy eat, breathes and lives and sleeps this method of empowering his team. I went to his locations and I physically sat with him and I had pizza and broke bread with him as the service in his restaurant was beginning for the day. And I kind of saw this beautiful symphony of people with precision buzzing around and getting everything right. And and Nick knew every single person's name. He was on a first name basis. It wasn't hello, Mr. Cyril. Everyone was, hey, Nick, hey, Nick, and shaking hands. And he knew every person's name. He's as genuine as you possibly can get. And we talked surface level about his business, you know, but then he took me downstairs to the lower level. That's where it got absolutely fascinating. On the wall, every night or every day is tacked the business's financial statements. So every single person, from the person washing to the dishes, to the person welcoming the guests, to, you know, the manager who's, who kind of uh, oversees the floor operations, anyone can go down there at any point and see how the business is doing. Uh, what, what is the profit level? What are the goals? <laughs> what are the targets? And then there's a, an entire huge board. Uh, noting what people make. And that's to say, you know, everyone knows when people come in and what their starting rate is, but you can progress up the ranks in the restaurant based on what you want to learn. And there are check boxes saying, if you learn this and learn this and learn this, you'll make X amount of money more. And okay, I want to do those things. How do I do it? Well, Nick will train you. Nick and his staff will train you in exactly how you can do that. And you walk around the the, biz- the business and there might be you know, a teenager uh, overseeing the floor operations, or, you know, they might move to welcoming guests one night, or they might move to waiting tables uh, another night. But they are empowered to learn all aspects of the business and to grow as much as they want to grow. And Nick has taken those methods and, and, you know, he he built this uh, thing meant for internal purposes called Nick's University. 
where his staff would train his other staff to grow and evolve in the career. But those methods like absolutely went viral and everyone learned how he is empowering his employees. And, and you know, you might have a 17 year old teaching a class at Nick's university, which is now open to the public. And there might be a C-level person in there from a fortune 500 company learning from a 17 year old who's teaching about management and dynamics and how to, how to interact with coworkers. It's the most when you see it, it just kind of makes sense. Trust, empowering your employees, absolute transparency baked into the very woodwork of the walls. Uh, you know, many of the walls Nick built himself. It's incredible. The Little Big Business, I believe, is the name of his book. Amazing guy. And I included that in the book because, you know, I wanted to show that these dynamics can apply genuinely to any environment, agency, studio, tech what have you, any trade. The example of the pizzeria maker in a book about design, I've gotten tremendous feedback on that. And, and Nick is truly a great guy. And you're living your own values of spotting inspiration in places that aren't normal as well. But going back to some of the challenges that we all have, and one of the big challenges in agencies, and there's a line I pulled from the book that carries a lot of weight, and it's the weight with which unhealthy relationship synergies can and will undermine team members' collective confidence is massive. A lack of constructive mentorship and supportive guidance or leaders who elevate themselves above those whose skill sets they should be cultivating, these things are as poisonous as open hostility. And here's where you call out the huge enemy that obviously Nick is lacking, which is ego, which is rife in so many creative cultures, creative agencies, developers, software developers, et cetera, et cetera, and it kills culture. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. When, you know, I also say when there's, when there's too much ego in the room, there's not much room for anything else, for creativity, for innovation, for passion, for design. Humility is so key to a human-centered dynamic. That human-centered dynamic is really predicated upon empathy and humility. That core lesson that we're taught in our fundamental years, uh, treat others the way you want to be treated. It's not just something that's on a sign in a wall in a third grade classroom. That's really something that we should bring through with us our entire career from the, the most junior levels in our career to what, you know, as high as the sky will, will take us. Ego absolutely kills innovation. It kills evolution. It kills design process. It kills the office dynamic. It is absolutely toxic and it can either be very much out there as poisonous as open hostility. I mean, the, the implication there is that there's a lot of passive aggressiveness kind of comes in that. I mean, think about, you know, being backseat creative directed when you have someone looming over your shoulder and it's like, ah, oh, you might, you know, maybe try it this way or let's go ahead and do this or make the logo bigger. Like all, all that kind of BS that is now an online meme. I mean, a lot of us have lived that and it's, it's funny to, to read and people kind of laugh and, and groan because they think back to when they've had these interactions. But yeah, ego is absolutely to toxic. It could sink so many of the things I said. It could sink a business. It's really a non-trivial thing. When I was a junior employee at, at a business that did not have a healthy culture, and I would uh, present work to a client in, in person or on the phone, and like rather than the dy dynamic in the room of knowing someone had my back, I knew if I said something that was off or if I made a mistake or I should have said something about the work that I didn't, Rather than having a dialogue with my manager, my team afterwards, and, and you know being coached or how, how to evolve, I knew I was going to get threatened or I was going to get pulled into an office by someone and, and you know verbally thrashed. And like you don't want to evolve then. You, you don't want to grow. You don't want to be there. You don't want to do good work. And the ego that is the baseline of that, rather than that humility or putting yourself in someone treating someone else like you'd like to be treated. And putting myself on the other side of that desk of the employee being in receipt of that feedback, if ego fuels any dynamic, it's going to fail. So it is the most non-trivial thing I can, I can think of. There's a great analogy I heard before, and I used it in a week, write a, a weekly blog, and it's called the black walnut effect, right? And basically, the black walnut tree is this big, magnificent tree. And it releases a toxin called juglone. And the toxin is spread around the area below the, the tree. So it kills everything that's trying to grow. It, it kills any vegetation. It kills any up-and-coming trees. And the whole concept is 
in order to be big and beautiful, it has to kill everything else around it. And it, it's, it reminded me of this. It reminded me of the ego in the business. Perhaps it's a killer developer. Perhaps it's an amazing salesperson in your team that has contacts that you believe are so important to the company that despite them being toxic, that you keep them in there. And this is very, very common in the creative field and developing, et cetera, et cetera. To use another example of someone who's not in a, in a design-related field, I, I think of uh, Zhang Quan, who's largely regarded as you know one of the best or most talented, I should say, culinary uh, experts on the planet. A Zen Buddhist nun prepares a vegan meals for her community, I think in a temple south of Seoul, Korea. Largely regarded one of the, one of the most talented and innovative chefs in the world. And one of her quotes is, creativity and ego cannot go together. And I find myself using that in just about every talk I've, I've given of late, because you have this person who is incredibly highly regarded, doesn't have a, a culinary line with her logo on it, or doesn't have a restaurant on the Las Vegas Strip, but people make the pilgrimage to her temple to sample her food and everything is, is like transcendental. You know, she grows her own veggies. If a bird comes down and, and, you know, eats things in the garden, she's, you know, that's nature intended that for that to happen. She just rolls with it. And she has this inner peace about her that saturates every movement and every, every ingredient she prepares. And she kind of plays the long game with how she prepares her food and, and prepares her sauces and things like that. You know, when you have this person who can have the world at their fingertips like that, but is just doing what she does based on connection, and she says that so very often, I think there's so much to be learned from that and to be that the humility to be baked into what we do as creators and, uh, you know, ultimately innovators. And one of the ways you make this live in an agency is how you give feedback. So for example, you're having that weekly feedback, maybe somebody's pitching some ideas, et cetera, that the feedback is given with humility rather than with ego. Sure. Feedback is something I, I take incredibly seriously in every place I've worked with. And I, I always coach my team on how to give objective feedback. It's always objective versus subjective. And ego, obviously, in a feedback sense, I mentioned backseat creative directing before. That feedback is going to be fueled by an individual projecting themselves onto the work or the process or the product. Obviously, that's not the healthy way to go about it. But even if you are in a healthy dynamic and you're giving feedback and, you know, someone is, you know, you're looking at a sketch or you're looking at something further along down the line or a prototype or something tangible or, you know, what, what have you, to look at something in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an office or creative environment and say, I like it, that's a, a nice comment. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's a nice comment, but it, there's absolutely nothing you can do with that. I like it. What you can leverage is this is successful because it accomplishes X or this accomplishes our goals because of Y. All feedback needs to be actionable and objective. No one's going to grow from I like it. That makes me feel good and then it's dead. Or if you see something that is not working, ugh, that sucks. Or I don't, I don't like it. Okay, you know, but what do I do with that? You know, what is effective is this isn't achieving our goals because of X or this isn't, you know, a, a user wouldn't be able to interact with this because of Y. I can learn from that. I can grow from that. So feedback in an objective sense, uh, you know, absolutely fuels growth and fuels innovation and, and fuels the progressing of creative projects, a process and evolution. But ego driven feedback, the worst, <laughs> you know, you're going to get nothing from that. Objective feedback in a healthy environment is absolutely key. Yeah, and here's another thing you talk about, which is so relevant in the creative field, is this dreaded term, 100% billable time, where people, again, we mentioned earlier on, shielding their screens for fear that they may be looking at something that's other than a project open. And this you mentioned this happened to you before, where people catch you not looking at projects and kind of go, oh, well, obviously you don't have enough work, instead of seeing it as an opportunity for that white space we talked about earlier on. Right. The uh, 100% billable time in the agency space, uh, I found historically in my career that that's, that's the most rife. And I'm not operating in a fantasy land scenario here in any capacity. I understand billable work uh, keeps the lights on. It pays salaries. It gives you health insurance. I get that completely. But that is to say, again, you know, I mentioned somebody's value is not determined by who's, who's the last one out the door at the end of the day, or people should not be viewed as a name on a spreadsheet. 
no good is going to come from people having to have their heads down uh, and pounding away at work for, from nine to five. You, we mentioned the white space. W- where's the time for, uh, like I said, that human connection? Or where's the time to step away from your desk and engage in a different creative pursuit to refuel those, you know, those synapses firing so you can innovate and you can uh, re-collaborate and reconnect with your coworkers. And I, I mentioned the book about having an area where you can maybe work on a puzzle or you can go over and tinker a little bit or, or you know, uh, uh, put some Legos together with a coworker. At that point, you are pausing with intent. I mentioned that that before. But you're also collaborating, or maybe you're working in solitude, you know, and you just need to exercise your motor skills and in, in a different form of programmatic or, you know, creative problem solving rather than a, a finger clicking a mouse. Having the leeway to do that as a step one, even knowing I can do that in my office space or my studio or my environment and not have someone casting side glances uh, at me or, or feel like I'm going to be judged, that alone is, is so uh, liberating and humanizing. And, and freeing, but to be able to go over someplace or walk around the block, or like I said, maybe you're you're going to play with some Legos, or you're going to work on a puzzle, or, or sketch something that has nothing to do with work for a little bit. Having that that ability to do that and not feel judged, but to feel supported, absolutely key. And I, I've seen this in practice. I, I've read about this. That time is vital, and, and it's something I make sure my teams are also, uh, as a known quantity, that is something they can absolutely utilize. Yeah, and they need to see the leader leading the way because that makes it okay. Because you see so many of these companies, a lot of tech firms, and the tech firms have brought in this idea of having the gym, having the food there, having breakfast, et cetera, et cetera. But oftentimes, as you call them out, they're cultural band-aids and they're you know perks in sheep's clothing. And you say there's ways to call this out and look to the interview process and maybe do your research before you join a company, before you go in there and realize, "Uh uh-oh, I've made a mistake. I've had this happen. I I remember uh, on a flight back from uh, doing some uh, ethnographic research on the West Coast and I was was tired and I opened an in-flight magazine and it was a long flight and it was uh, a tech firm talking about how they had sleep pods in their office. And if you're burned out, you can go in the sleep pod and you know, take a nap for 45 minutes or an hour and then you're ready to go and you can, you know, work into the night. And I remember, you know, being exhausted from what I was doing. I'm like, Hey, that sounds pretty good. But then, you know, I thought about it a little further and and I dug in a little bit more and I did my research when I, when I landed and I got back home and the perks like these, like, you know, the sleep pods or, you know, if if you're working till nine o'clock, we'll pay for your cap or, if you're working over the weekend, we'll send, you know, a cleaning crew over to your house to clean up your place. And on the surface, that's like, oh man, that's great. They're looking out for me. Think about what's below that, that service level. Everything is designed to keep you at the office longer. I mean, why, why leave work when I can stay here and somebody will clean my place or, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm here till nine, 10 o'clock. I mean, I'll, I'll get a free cab home. So yeah, I say cultural band-aids, which is, uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but these things are, you know, you said wolf and sheep's clothing that these are the things you absolutely have to watch out for these surface level perks and the band-aid side of things, you know, if you go in a place and there's a pinball machine or a foosball table and, you know, or an arcade cabinet or a, a PlayStation and it's like, you know, that that's cool, but, but can people use those things and not be judged? Can someone literally sit down and play PlayStation and, you know, uh, blow off some steam or, and go back to the, their desk and not be judged? Or is that the only reason by which a, a business defines a creative culture? Absolutely not. You cannot do that. That that is, you know, throwing a bone to the masses to say, look, we're cool. You know, here, here here's an arcade cabinet. What what else is going on? What else are you doing for your teams? I mean, do they have that time to pause with intent? Are they able to leave early? Uh, you know, to be with their families? Can they work remotely offsite or from a coffee shop? You have to look at all those other uh, surrounding factors. And I mentioned uh, something else. If you're interviewing for a business. And some of those things are important to you. If it is important to work at a coffee shop, if it is important to be able to go out and, and be inspired by the world around you and bring it back in your office space, ask, ask the company you're interviewing with, you know, can I work from a coffee shop? Sure you can. And then you say, great. You know, which ones? I mean, how often can I do that? Is there a time limit? Can I do it? You know, all the time, be armed with the things that are important to you to really drill into the culture. And you'll be able to tell if you get flop sweat or a genuine answer at that point, which are informative to, you know, what you're signing up for. And you talk about the importance of good, and I'm 100% with you on this one. And I've ignored my good in the past 
I've gone against it. I've gone for brands over culture and it never works out, you know, and the gut has a brain in it and the gut is always telling you and you say, we need to really importantly distinguish between day one jitters and gut revealing red flags. And here you talk about what you call the day five principle. When you sign up for a business and, you know, say you've done your homework and you've interviewed and everything sounds good and you're actually in it in the first week and there is no new day one. It is, it is a five day week. Okay. That, that's fine. Or you start to notice that there are cots around the office for, you know, and you actually see people sleeping in them uh, because they're, they're there so late or, you know, you get thrown right into a project. You can tell effectively to sum it up, what you signed up for is not what you are getting. And what I say is the, the core point here, and this is what I wrap the book up with ultimately is don't settle. My main driving line there is because you signed up for a, you know, a new role, don't feel that you are beholden to them because you are afraid to make a change. I mean, I, I know people have to put food on the table. I understand that. I know people have to pay their bills. I, I get that too. I've, I've, I've absolutely been there. But settling for years in a position because you feel you owe the business or you're obligated to do X that can take years off your creative evolution or your, your, your passion or your design life, <laughs> if you will. And, uh, you know, I, I have talked about stories that resonate cross industry or cross media. This is absolutely one, this notion of settling. I was asked recently, you know, what is one thing I would tell my younger self and, and don't settle is absolutely that thing. And the day five principle that you mentioned is give it five days. And, you know, every recruiter on the, on the planet is going to give me dagger in the eyes. Give it five days. And C, is, is what you signed up for really what you are getting? And I say five days because I think in the course of a week, and there are off weeks and there are on weeks, and I, I get that. And maybe it's five days, maybe it's, maybe it's 10 days, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a month. But really don't have blinders on when you sign up for a place. You, you just mentioned you've signed up for brands over places that are doing good human-centered procedural or cultural work. I've done that as well. And don't have blinders on towards what you signed up for. Uh, there are places out there. This is the other corp, uh, other side of the coin. There are places out there who are doing it right and are completely transparent and are what you sign up for is exactly what you're getting. So do your homework as much as possible in advance. And I mentioned when you're interviewing, inter ask ask the que ask about the things that are important to you. It's not a one way monologue. It's a two way dialogue and a two way street and a conversation rather than an oration. So ask about the things that are important to you, dig into what you want to know and see what kind of genuine answers you're getting. I feel like if you're interviewing with, at a place and you ask, can I talk to people who work here? Can I talk to a client? Can I talk to someone who's left? If you're transparent and you believe in your, in your business, you should be open about all of those things. I, I think there are a lot of ways to prevent having to invoke, if you will, the day five principle. But again, just not settling and not devolving it into burnout is really important. I love that message. I lecture in a business school and I tell the students, don't go for a brand over a culture because you'll always regret it. And more importantly, don't do it because you think your parents will be proud of you or your friends will be proud of you. And if you need to leave, leave. Don't care what they will say. I've done it. I've stayed longer than I should in places because people will judge you and they go, oh, that guy's always moving. Who cares? Life is too short. Whatever about your creative life, life is too short because we deserve to work in a place that actually fulfills us some way or at least as much as possible align your values with the values of the company. And that's why I love this book. And just, you'll love this, man, because I, I realized you did the graphics on the book and they're beautiful. And I had the book last night. I was putting my son, he's six, to bed. And I had the book in my hand. He reads his Pokemon book beside me. And he, he goes, he, he's like, Dad, I love that. Did you draw that? And I was like, no, no, Dad's not that talented. The graphics really caught him. It's a beautifully illustrated book. And it's an easy read because you've written it that way. You've thought about the user, the other side, which is your skill and it's human centered book, et cetera. I really highly recommend it for people working in agencies, people running agencies, because it's a nice template for how an agency should be run. Justin, where can people find out more about you, the agency, et cetera? Yeah, I, thanks, Aiden. I appreciate that. So the-culturebook.com is the uh, website for the book, uh, the underscore Culture Book is where you can find uh, anything book related on social media. 
Uh, personally, I am at Pseudoroom, P-S-E-U-D-O, Room, uh, on all social media. And my Twitter DMs are open, so I can easily be contacted there. And Pseudoroom.com is my personal uh, folio and, and way to contact me for speaking and things like that. Regarding the book, Cultivating a Creative Culture is the book. I am currently uh, in, in the process of working on the second edition, which is going to have a bit more about human-centered design process and its relation to uh, human-centered culture and, and the touch points there. Uh, that should be out June or summer of uh, next year. Author of Cultivating a Creative Culture, Justin Thauer, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Aiden. I really appreciate it.